Uh, thank you for coming to my session. This session is monitoring and visualizing your microservices. I'm Shin Tarimoto from Japan. In this session, I'll talk about monitoring, of course. It contains what data to collect and how to configure the tools to build it, the, the monitoring environment, as well as some tips and pitfalls. And here's source code for the applications and the monitoring environment used in today's demo, Bitly JC 2019 monitoring. It is shorten URL to the GitHub. Don't worry, it's not spam or no wheels. Today I wanna talk uh, extensively about monitoring and visualizations, so I don't have much time to talk about the individual details. So if we want to know about the configuration details, please refer to the GitHub page. The source code of the demo application and the Docker Compose files to build the monitoring environments are available. So if you would rather see the source code than listening to the story, please check it out now. Then let me introduce myself. I'm Shin Tarimoto. My Twitter account is CRO Andabati. Now I'm a senior architect or a troubleshooter working for Everforce and AcroQuest Technology, two companies in Japan. And I'm a leader of Japan Java user group, JJUZ, and also a Java champion and um, work with Groundbreaker Ambassador. Uh, like, uh, I'm kind of a community person. I'm a super, I, I really love fighting games like Street Fighters, and I'm a huge fan of baby metal. Okay, so when it comes to monitoring, what do you think of? Do you think, uh, do you think about which tools should be used, or what kind of chart to be created, or how alerting should be? By the way, when we discuss about application architectures. We don't talk too much about tools or frameworks or libraries, do we? First of all, uh, we talk about structures or principles, and then language and tools and frameworks comes. On the other hand, when we discuss about the monitoring or visualization, we tend to talk too much about tools, don't we? So Zavix, Prometheus, Grafana, Elasticsearch, etc. The so tool is just one aspect of monitoring. And basically, the way we should develop an application is you know, to start with thinking about the use cases. So I'd like to consider about monitoring and visualization from the use cases. So there are several use cases that require monitoring and visualizations. The first is monitoring, monitoring operation. Sorry, it's a little confusing, but the monitoring here yeah, means the daily operation of monitoring. And the second is alerting. And the third one is troubleshooting. And the last, the, there is one more thing, discovering. So in, in other words, monitoring means knowing what is going on now. It is not about the past, not the future. It is to know the current status. And then alert is to notice about the changes from good to, good to bad. So if there is no alert, we hope system runs well. But as soon as the system go bad, we can get notification via email, or like message, or Twitter, DM, et cetera. And troubleshooting is knowing what happened in the past. It's the past thing. The trends, events, whatever, just happened in the past were evidences. The troubleshooting is, is, is to collect those evidences and to clarify what happened and what the actual cause of the problem was. And discovering is knowing the unknown things. The unknown may be about the future or it may have happened in the past that we have overlooked. Today I don't have to talk much about discovering, but this is an important use case. So before we move on to the monitoring, let me talk about a little bit in metaphor. Imag uh, let me imagine a car. A car has tachometer to display the speed of the car. It shows only the current speed. You know, not the speed of the past, not speed of the future, of course. And there is no history of speed, but it's enough to know the current status. It can be said that driver can monitor the status of their cars. That's what I call monitoring. So what if 
the, this measure of the car is the uh, time series line chart. So that could be useful for analysis space, but the drivers don't need to know the, how fast was their car five minutes ago. So then the driver should focus on the current speed. And for alerting, about 40 years ago, Japanese cars were equipped with a warning sound, uh, warning sound when the speed exceeded 100 km per hour. So it sound king kong, king kong, king kong. So th that is alerting. Even if the driver takes his eye off from the off of the meter, the sound makes him aware that he drives too fast. But uh, unfortunately, it's gone for about 10 years. Why? Because everyone ignored it, ignored the alert. It's quite often running a little over 100 km per hour on the highway, and it can be annoying or even drowsy or make us sleep if it keeps on conking, conking, conking for several minutes or a few hours. And this alert was no use on roads with a speed limit of 60 km per hour. So it's a classic example of inflexible alerts being ignored. And suppose this car causes a traffic accident. After that, what will be necessary for in investigations? The, of course, it's not a tachometer. You know, I if we had a speed log, that must be, that must have been important evidence, but cars don't have the speed log for now. The recently more cars are equipped with the drive recorders, now, which records the video of the surrounding of a car, which is very useful evidence. So that is to say for troubleshooting, the past records or logs are useful. On the other hand, uh, I don't believe the people's statement because people sometimes lie or uh, there is possibility that they will say something wrong based on their assumptions. So some physical evidence are more useful. And by the way, by collecting and analyzing information on the driver's uh, steering operation or uh, foot pedal operations, uh, we may be able to discover the characteristic of the drivers who often cause the accident that we didn't know until now. Uh, encouraging such people to make improvements may prevent future accidents. So that's a discovering what I talked. So we should think about the monitoring environment by understanding these the use cases or uh, yeah, this, uh, uh, these ways. So in other words, thinking carefully about what this chart is or uh, or whether this is really the way it should be, or yeah, like that. So I think such kind of process is necessary in system development. Okay, then this is the agenda for this session. The first is collecting data. I will explain what kind of data should be collected. And next, I'll talk about the tools about, and configurations for build, building a monitoring environment. Then, as a trivia, I'll introduce some tips and pitfalls. And finally, I'd like to explain some guidelines for improving monitoring operations. Okay, first, I'd like to think about what kind of data we should collect. Uh, in this session, I assume that microservices of simple e-commerce, easy, easy site, are uh, being monitored. The UI is Vue.js, which calls a backend uh, which calls a backend service called the store web, which calls various uh, several microservices built on Spring Boot. Okay, let's move on to demo. The demo application is uh, deployed on the Oracle Cloud, the best cloud in the world. Now, now I can see the instance. Yeah, like EC2, EC2 of the AWS, it is uh, running. And this is the uh, Eureka, the discovery server of the Spring Boot microservices. And there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven services running. And this is the uh, e-commerce site example. 
we can we can buy some CDs or Blu-rays, like one, two, and check check out the card and purchase. Uh, I think I could uh, I succeed to buy something. And this is the target application of monitoring. And let's go back to the presentation. So take this e-commerce application as a target. We collect the data for monitoring and visualizing. The data we have to collect are roughly divided into two categories, metrics and logs, and sometimes traces. So metrics are time series numerical data. For example, CPU usages and memory usage memory usages, or the number of HTTP accesses. The most of those data are collected on a sampling basis. In, a, in other words, uh, some agents check the status every fixed time and save it as a number. And logs, on the other hand, are text message with a timestamp, such as uh, access logs and GC logs, application logs. And logs are triggered by some event, event-based. The access log is uh, logged for each user access, and uh, this log is logged for each garbage collection occurrence. So in general, logs tend to be larger than metrics. The text is larger than numbers, and logging events occur fre frequently. So let's take a closer look at metrics. Metrics can be broadly divided into three categories, resources, performance and health. Our resource metric is how much of the limited capacity is being used. To figure that, for example, CPU usages and disk usages. If the CPU usage is high, we are running out of CPU, so we should either change to a server with more CPUs or in investigate the performance bottleneck to reduce CPU usages. And for JVM resources, the heap information is must. And the information about the DCs and threads is particularly useful for performance troubleshooting, I think. So what e each metric shows is divided here into capacity and performance. So when capacity runs out, the system will shut down soon. So we have to deal with it when it exceeds a certain level. So we must monitor them and configure alerts from them. So it is the same as checking the water level of the, over some river or lake. On the other hand, we may not keep watching the performance metrics. They are useful indicator for troubleshooting, such as looking for bottlenecks or, or service performance is poor. Uh, in other words, metrics of capacity should be monitored and alerted. Uh, as needed. And the performance metrics uh, for troubleshooting. Uh, of course, we, are, we, use, we use the monitoring, alerting level of metrics for troubleshooting too. And in my opinion, uh, we don't have to set a threshold for the thread count, the last one, at, uh, of, of course at first. But we should check with human eyes to see if it's uh, as expected. So by the way, why I bother to, uh, to separate like this? That's because it's hard to collect a lot of metrics and set them all to have threshold for alerting at first. So it is important to start small with a policy of co collecting a limited number of metrics and setting alerts only for those uh, more important at first. So nothing will con continue if it's hard, it's too hard, I think. And there are metrics about performance. For performance metrics, front-end web serv servers that are accessed by user are particularly important. Their response time should be monitored so that the user does not feel slow. On the other hand, the response time of the underlying microservices is less important because microservices may be running async asynchronously. If one of synchronous micro microservices is slow, the front-end server will also be slow. So in this respect, 
the response time of the front end web server is suggest, subject to monitoring and alerting. While the microservices uh, response time is a troubleshooting area, the response from the database server will also be an indication for troubleshooting purpose. Even if, even if a SQL, SQL, SQL is slow, there is no problem if it is a batch process at night or um, a synchronous process. So slow SQL is not always a problem. So uh, uh, we don't have to uh, mo mo continuous monitoring uh, for all the time. So whether or not it is slow from the user's point of view is the key indicator to whether the system is good or bad. And next, well, the last one is the health. The health metrics includes how many HTTP accesses there are and whether we, uh, each HTTP status was 200 or 500, 300, 400, whatever. So here I call them metrics. But they are actually aggregations from access logs. So in that sense, they, are, they might be classified as uh, logging, not met logging, not metrics. But for convenience, so they are called um, here as metrics. The classification of these health metrics is similar to the previous performance metrics. The access count and the HTTP status on the front end server are particularly important and should be monitored. But the internal microservice metrics can only be used during troubleshooting to identify which server causes the error. And by the way, uh, for the HTTP access count, too much is a problem, of course, but and too less is also a problem. If there is little user dur during the day, there may be a problem, so we should also be alerting. So HT and HTTP status trends, on the other hand, are not suggest subject to alerting because uh, uh, it is difficult to set threshold, threshold at first. So we should check it with our eyes at first. And the next one is logs. These logs should be collected. The log details will basically only be viewed during troubleshooting, but you can't, we can't ignore the errors in the application log, error log. So I'll talk about this later. So now that, uh, anyway, I, I've listed up metrics and logs to be collected. So let's look at how we can build an environment that collects and collect and visualize the data I've listed, building my monitoring environment. So this is basic data collection and visualization flow. Suppose we are deploying a Spring Boot application on a, on a server or on a container such as Docker or Kubernetes. I mean, there are several servers or containers which have a only have only have a single microservice. Agents running on this server or container collect metrics and uh, met, collect metrics and logs and transfer them to the data store. And the visualizer, upright one, access, accesses the data store to retrieve information and visualize them. And the alerting mechanism also access the data store and compare the data with the given threshold and issues alerts as needed. So basically, monitoring and the visualization tool works on this architecture uh, with minor differences. So here I just described an, an only one agent, but it is actually divided into several agents. Let's take a closer look. The agent at the server, the top one, or a container, sends the metrics of server resources to the data store, like CPU or memory usages. And the agent running in the Spring Boot, in the Spring Boot, in app agent, uh, also sends the metrics of JVM, so like heap information or GC information to the data store. And the logs output from the Spring Boot application is forwarded to the data store by the log shipper agent. So there are three types of agent here. And agents are thus separated by purpose. So some agents like FluentD uh, may play multi multiple roles, 
but for the sake of convenience, they are considered separate, separate here. So now let's think about what, what the tools. Now I will talk about the tools we should use. There are many options, but I want to focus on Elasticsearch and Kibana for this presentation. Elasticsearch is an open source full text search engine. It was, it was originally used as a search engine only, but uh, over the last several years, uh, it has been used ex uh, extensively for logging metrics and traces and, and visualization in combination with Kibana. Kibana is a tool for visualize, visualizing elastic search data. We can view various data and create new visualizations such as charts, maps, tables, etc. in web browser using Kibana. The reason for using elastic search is that uh, there are quite a few open source software which can handle both logs and metrics. The many monitoring tools store only time series numeric data and cannot store the logs. Also, uh, even if a monitoring tool can store logs, the uh, search is often quite slow with so-called linear search like grep, uh, GREP, grep. Elasticsearch takes advantage of being a full text search engine that allows us to quickly search and aggregate logs. And let me explain about, uh, let me explain a little more why I use uh, Elasticsearch and Kibana. Uh, there is what SPOG, or single pane knob glass. It means uh, to see all information with single tool. I think uh, the monitoring environment should be like a baseball scoreboard. In other words, everyone watch the same thing and they can see the situation at a glance and yeah, they can watch the same data, no segregations. If we do, do this with multiple tools, we'll have to put them side by side to see what's going on and sometimes we have to set the set same configuration to different tools. What's more, different tools can cause our communication losses. So I'm focused on centralizing it into one tool, and I want to use Elasticsearch and Kibana to realize the idea of SPLG. So when we build a monitoring environment around Elasticsearch, we use these agents or data collectors. Uh, there are three data collectors. The metric bit collects and transfer server, server or container resources, well, metrics of the server or container resources to Elasticsearch. And the file bit or FluentD, yeah, file bit or FluentD collects logs and transfer them, transfer the logs to Elasticsearch. And Elastic APM and Elastic APM Java agent is a little hard to explain exactly, but it is an application performance monitoring APM, actually. So which has a function to collect JVM resources and transfer them to Elasticsearch. It also has a function to trace Java application behaviors. I'll show it later. Okay, I've talked a lot uh, about it, but the overall structure is like this. This is a case when running on uh, microservice on the, on the server. So micro uh, metric bit collects the top one, collects the server metrics and sends them to Elasticsearch. The, and the uh, Elastic APM Java agent send JVM metrics to Elasticsearch. And the log files are collected by file bit and sent to Elasticsearch. We can visualize it with Kibana. And this is a case with uh, containers like Docker. Unlike running on the server, uh, only the Spring Boot application runs on the container. So micro, uh, me metric bit and Fluent D is running out of the container of a Spring Boot application. And me metric bit collects container information from the outside of the target container and sends it, sends it to Elasticsearch. And the Fluent D, the bottom one, uh, sends logs to Elasticsearch via Fluent D log driver. Uh, which is built, in, uh, built into Docker by default, the Docker function. The Fluentd log driver is a kind of Docker function. 
the rest is the same as running on the server. My demo application runs on Docker, so I configured this way. So that explanation has become very long, so let me show you a demo here. Okay, I, I buy some items again, and to the seed, and purchase. And let's take a look at, at the first APN. This is the Elastic APM with Kibana. Does not respond. <laughs> Last. Minutes. The Elastic Java agent collects the uh, very visible the CPU usage, CPU usage, usage and C memory usage, memory usage, and the heap and non-heap memory metrics, and also thread count. That is the metrics that ap uh, Elastic APM Java agents collect from the single container. And here's, here's uh, transactions. This is, mm. check out. I, And this is the APM function. The sto store web that was the, the front end server, uh, front end, uh, back end, uh, back end for front, back end for front, front end. The, from the uh, store web, and all the, co all the service is called. And here is the order service. And next, all the, other control, other service calls some SQLs and other service. This is here. You can see that the other service calls the cut service, and cut service uses some SQLs, and then uh, it calls item service, and the item service calls the SQL. You can check the bottleneck or the application traces using the Elastic APM. And let's take a look at logs. Not only metrics, I collected the logs of the uh, microservices. I collected the access logs. No, open. These are access logs of the today. Uh, okay, okay. Access log of the microservices, and there are only a few only a few items here: the service name or method, and path, and status, and the duration in milliseconds. And the, but you. You can check the all other items to open the single log line. This information are collected and stored to the elastic search. This is the access log, ordinal access log, and and also I collect the, the application log. Yeah, application log is like this. There are there are sub service name and the level of the uh, log log level level and the message message. It's a, quite natural, but and I can 
search, search logs from the Kibana dashboard. I have limited time, so I should go back to the presentation. Okay. So let's take a look at the configuration the agent, but I don't have time, so please look at the presentation slide later. I'll skip the presentation of the configurations. The metric period can be used from out of the box data, and you can use Elastic APM using some uh, uh, maybe dependencies, dependency, and uh, a little bit, a little bit source code modification. And then you can use FluentD with some uh, FluentD configuration with the uh, Docker configuration. Okay, then now that we've covered the configuration, so let's take a look at the, some useful tips and pitfalls to be aware of. The number, tips number one is logs should be JSON formatted. So whether it's an access log or an application log, a log file is basically a single line. And a log file is, uh, in order to store it to Elasticsearch, we need, need to pass the log, the single log, and name each item. So in this case, FluentD has the load to pass the logs. So this can be tricky, and we need to create grok patterns uh, that combine regular expression patterns and name each item in the log, such as timestamp, and yeah, severity, service, trace, span, yeah, whatever, whatever. So it is quite hard to think that we have to write the pass configuration on the fluent side, fluent side for the number of logs type, log types. So when we add a new type of log, we need to add grok configuration to FluentD too. And logs also can be multi, multi, multiple lines, such as when a stack trace is printed to the log. In particular, uh, with containers like Docker and Kubernetes, the single line of log is recognized as a single event. So making it difficult to merge multi multiple lines of log to a single event. So it's like aggregation of stream events, so it's hard. So given that complexity, it's useful to format logs as JSON at the log output time, not the past time. So with JSON, the stack trace is just one field of JSON, and we will not, ha we will not have to pass it. I recommend to use log stash, log back encoder to convert the Java application log to JSON, JSON format, format. We can easily output the log in JSON format with the log back configuration the, uh, up there. On the other hand, the format of NGX or Tomcat access log as JSON, we need to use a more aggressive or uh, so robust Powerful approach. Here's how to set up Tomcat access log to JSON. You can see that the server Tomcat access log pattern is, uh, you know, this is just a single line JSON. Uh, it is kind of a uh, power. But uh, anyway, it is highly recommended that we use JSON formatted log, uh, JSON format log, because it eliminates the need for passing and care about the multi-line processing. And the tips number two is logs should be distributed, trace, traced. I have, I have 10 more minutes, okay. Thinking about monolithic Java application, we can trace the application behaviors from the logs. The, the classic monolithic, uh, as for classic monolithic Java application. So even among the uh, concurrent processes in the multi thread, we can use the thread ID to specify the process that we want to watch. But as the microservices, logs are also micro partitioned, then it is hard to trace the application behavior from the logs. Here we can use the distributed tracing. Uh, it's a little hard to explain about distributed tracing, but in short, it's like thread ID or request ID in the microservices. The first service, uh, but I have no time, so I 
can skip this slide and uh, all I want to claim is that distributed tracing has more powerful functions, but uh, I have nothing to talk about more t today because here comes a professional distributed tracing Adrian code there. So please join his session from 5 p.m. if you want to know about the distributed tracing. And I want to uh, talk about the pitfalls. Alerting can only detect the predictable problems. But please be careful that the threshold-based alerting can detect only the problems we already know what we can predict. predict. If we don't call, uh, if we do not collect disk UCCs, of course we cannot detect the, the, detect the disk UCCs high. So why do we collect CPU UCCs? Because we already know that CP, CPU UCCs tends to be high. So and why don't we collect CPU temperatures? Because we trust hardware, or we just indifferent to it, or just ignore it, don't we? So if we, you have to take care about hardware, yes, you should collect CPU temperatures. That's what you should do. Not all problems can be uh, predicted uh, from uh, at first. If, you, uh, if an unknown problem occurs, it should be fed back to the monitoring, monitoring, monitoring environment for the problems will occur in near future again. But the feedback approach is reactive to the problem. It is sometimes too late. So is there anything we can do in advance? One idea is to filter known logs. By filtering out debug logs, info logs, and known warning logs, and known error logs on Kibana, using Kibana, we can display only unknown logs. And if you have an, an unknown log, log line, uh, it may be an unknown problem. I think this is one of the few ways, one of the few ways we can find the unknown problems. In other words, the traditional method of monitoring logs has been the black box method, which is to alerting when to, uh, when it finds the known log messages. And this method I showed here, on the other hand, is a white box approach, where filtering out all known problems leaves unknown problems. So this is kind of a matter of responsibility of engineers. So the, this white box approach may, of course, increase our tasks or our jobs. Of course, so we have to cope with the problems. No one just knows, no one knows. But it makes the system more stable. So I said a matter of responsibility. And the pitfall too is leaving that process. Sometimes microservices appear to be running normally, but be done actually. Sometimes it happens. It returns 200 OK to the health stake request. And the metrics are sometimes normal, but no response at all. It's like a zombie looking alive, but actually dead. The cause of the problem varies, but it may have been caused by an unknown problem, such as a problem in a place that is not being monitored, or a problem that is not being handled due to an external cause. So to avoid this, this kind of problem, once I created monitoring by checking the last update time of the log for each services, as long as the, the application is running, the, uh, these, they should be, there should be some kind of application logs. And if it doesn't, I can assume it's dead. So I'm sorry I can't show you the actual visualization of this uh, monitor. Uh, Log last update, log uh, last update table. But uh, I would uh, appreciate if you could use it as a hint for monitoring. And the uh, last thing, when we build a monitoring environment, we focus on 
what we should monitor and how we collect the data, but we don't often think about the evaluating the monitoring environment itself. Then we should care about the KPI or key, point, key performance indicator of the monitoring itself. Often we focus on resources, logs, metrics as KPIs, but uh, we tend to forget to think about the KPIs of monitoring, monitoring itself. I mean, let's consider the monitoring KPI like this. For example, how about making these for KPIs? By uh, one is the mean time from when the problem occurs to when it is detected, average time. And number two is number of problems detected by alerting divided by total number of problems. Here, I mean, I can uh, find the, the hit ratio of the uh, alerting. And number three is the number of monitoring improvements and divided by total number of problems. Yeah, this is the ratio of improvement, improvements. And number four is uh, added, uh, combined two and three and divided by total number of problems. It is the coverage of the detection, error detection. By using these KPI or KPIs of improvement, we can clarify if the monitoring environment became, bet became better or not. So this, and this will motivate the monitoring team themselves and can be used to evaluate team members' the skills or the contributions. The monitoring system does not end once it is created, but should be improved by continuous feedbacks. And the monitoring improvements are often hard to see. So in my opinion, using these KPIs will make the monitoring environment better and the monitoring team too. Okay, so the presentation ends here, so thank you for coming. And here is the demo source code URL and my Twitter account. So feel free to ask any questions via Twitter. So thank you very much. Thank you.